Well, good morning. It's me, Kenny Polkari, your host of the party. And here I am again. Today is Thursday, August 17th, 2023. And here is it. Uh, here are the things that you need to know about what happened yesterday because it was an exciting day. And what have I been telling you all along? Hello, higher rates are on the path. The Fed, while maybe fractured a little bit on the inside, uh, remains hawkish, right? Ten-year treasuries, they spike higher. Shorter duration bills are now paying 5.5%. Oil trades at 80, gold is, gold is testing a little bit lower, and the dollar holds steady at 103.36. And what are we have for dinner? We're having the fava bean and broccoli risotto. Delicious. Okay, look, it's getting hot in the kitchen. The temperature is rising as the Fed minutes um, reiterate the need for higher for longer. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, the Fed minutes show nothing new. Unless, of course, you were in the camp that thought they were about to pause. A camp I was not in. In fact, the minutes uh, said it this way. And I, I think they were pretty clear, at least, well, the market thought they were pretty clear. Most participants continue to see significant upside risks to inflation, which would require further tightening of monetary policy. Uh, sounds clear to me. Uh, now, there are two Fed members, I said, that favored leaving rates unchanged in July, right? So that's that dovish contingent. But that wasn't happening. Ultimately, the committee unanimously authorized the, uh, the latest 25 base point hike in July. Moments after the minutes were released, Evercore economist Krishna Guha laid it out this way, right? Telling his clients, uh, and I'll quote, that the, uh, that the minutes from the July FOMC meeting frame the emerging tension between inflation data that is moderating faster than the Fed anticipated and growth data that is coming in stronger than the Fed anticipated, right? So there's the conundrum. They want to see the, the economic numbers start to come in weaker, and they're not. And this suggests that the Fed is stuck between where? A rock and a hard place. The July rate hike brought the U.S. terminal rate now to five and a quarter, five and a half percent. We know that. The highest it's been since 2001. But the minutes are now suggesting that we need to brace for more. I think I've been saying it ad nauseum that we need to brace for a terminal rate of six percent, right? A half a dozen Fed heads have also been intimating that as well. Neely Kashkari, Minneapolis Fed head, most recently confirmed it on Tuesday when he said that inflation is still too damn high while at the same time saying that he wants to impose tighter regulations on those regional banks. Remember what he did to banks that day, right? The banks got crushed a couple of days ago on the back of that. Now, to be fair, the Bloomberg economist Stewie Paul, he doesn't see it this way at all. In fact, he writes, though the, po though the post meeting statement and votes showed a united committee, the minutes confirmed that there's a dovish contingent, right? Those couple of guys who were not so sure. And that the broad market, the bond market bets on a finished rate hike cycle are likely accurate. Bond market bets on a finished rate hike cycle? Is this guy, is this guy kidding me? He thinks we're done? Did he even read the minutes? In the end, though, guess what? That's what makes a market, right? Both buyers and sellers. You're on one side of the fence, I'm on the other side of the fence. And that's what creates the excitement. Okay, look, this also, as JJ told us on July 26th, that we intend again to keep policy restrictive until we're confident inflation is coming down uh, sustainably, uh, substantially to our 2% target, right? And that we're prepared to tighten further if appropriate. <laughs> oh boy, it's so confusing. We're tightening, we're pausing, we're tightening, we're cutting, we're tightening again. Come on already. It reminds me of that 1961 musical, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off, right? It was a musical set against what? A circus backdrop. I mean, do I need to say anything more? In any event, the algos did not like what they heard or what they read or what they scraped, whatever. And stocks, which had been churning kind of in line all day, headed south upon the release of those minutes, right? By the end of the day, the Dow was down 180 points. The S&P lost 34 points. The NASDAQ down 156. The Russell down 25. And the transports gave up 167 points. Now, just to be clear, that now puts the Dow down 2.5%, the S&P down 4.4%, 4 .4%, the NASDAQ down 6.5%, the Russell down 6.5%, the transports down 5.5% since their most recent high three weeks ago. And this makes sense. We've been discussing it. The market action should not surprise you at all. Remember, anything less than 9.9% .9 on the downside is considered well within the normal range of trading. So this 
is normal. There's no reason to light your hair on fire yet. And the Wall Street Journal makes it very clear. They run with this headline. Bond yields hit the highest since 2008, adding pressure to borrowing costs. Bets that interest rates will, uh, which which have failed, to, which have suppressed the 10-year yields for the most of 2023, but analysts are warning that that may be changing. Treasury yields hit a 15-year high, and that suggests steeper borrowing costs, right? Higher rates. And that is what is raising the temperature in the kitchen, causing investors to consider the potential fallout for stocks. Think aggressive, sexy growth names like tech. Think utility stocks. Think bonds. Think housing. The 10-year yield ended the day yesterday at 4.258%, up from 4.22% on Tuesday, a rate that has not been seen since the collapse of Lehman Brothers on September 15, 2008. Now, that's just a reference point. I'm not suggesting any imminent danger, right? In the end, the 10-year is still below the current terminal rate set by the Fed. And what that means is that the 10-year yields could still rise. And if that happens, that will really turn the heat up in the kitchen, Gavish. Now... The 10-year yield has been moving up for four weeks now. Just uh, on July 18th, they were yielding 3.78%, right, versus yesterday. And that's being credited to ongoing solid economic data, suggesting that the elusive recession will remain elusive. Longer-term treasury yields are also getting a boost. Why? Because the government made it very clear that they need to borrow more money than anticipated to finance all the freewheeling spending by the Bidens and the far-left Democrats, and all that means is that there's going to be more bond supply on the market, which takes us back to what? Econ 101, supply and demand. More supply in the bond market equals lower prices equals higher yields. It's not complicated. I just don't, why, I just don't understand why anyone in the administration doesn't understand it. The two-year held steady at 4.95%, while shorter duration bills, the three and six months, continue to tease you by offering now 5.48 and 5.52% respectively. One-year CDs are pushing 5.5%. Are you beginning to see the other options that investors have? Now, every sector was low yesterday except utilities, which remains a bit odd. No, I just told you they should be under pressure. I mean, higher yields will put pressure on utilities. Remember, utility stocks are good divvy payers. So they average around 3 to 3.5%-ish, three right? But when rates were zero, utility stocks were all the rage. But as rates move up to 4 to quarter percent, then utility stocks will come under pressure because they're not paying that much. Um, and, and this year, as rates rose, we saw investors punish utilities. The sector, this boring sector, is down 10% year to date. So does yesterday's action suggest maybe some bargain hunting going on in this space? Maybe. Does the positive action in, say, metals and miners, XME, up three-tenths? That's only up 1% on the year. Coal and natural gas stocks up six-tenths. They were down 16% in the year. The contra trades, the dog is up 10, uh, 1%, uh, 1%, right? It's down 3% in the year. PSQ is up 1%. That was down 26% in the year. The VIXI was up 1.5%. That was down 55% in the year. Does that suggest bargain hunting? The worst performance yesterday, consumer discretionary XLA down one and a quarter. Tech down one, uh, one and a quarter. Communication down one and a quarter. Those three sectors are up more than 30% year to date. Housing lost 1.4%. That's up 38% year to date. Semis down 2%. They're up 38% year to date. Cybersecurity down 1%. It's up 16% year to date. Airlines and travel, the Jets ETF down 8 tenths. That was up 18% year to date. Right? And you're seeing where investors are now locking in profits and reallocating to the underperformers. Yes, they took money out of nearly every sector, but they're taking more money out of the outperformers, naturally. And that makes sense. Individual names like Tesla down 3%, Amazon down 2%, Meta down 2.5%, NVIDIA down 1%, right? Okay, you get it. I, I get it. Enough said. This morning, U.S. futures are up small. And again, that makes some sense as stocks struggle to find stability. Dow futures are up 78, the SP's up 10, the Nasdaq's up 33, the Russell's up 3. Now this is nice, but it's not convincing. It's, it's laughable that Bloomberg suggests futures are hinting at a recovery. A recovery? Are you kidding me? Right? I think they have, to, they have to let go of that data point, the idea that the Fed was done raising rates and that uh, you got to put on your big boy panties and you got to understand what's happening. The Fed waited way too long to move on rates. The Biden spent way too much money on stimulation and, and the reduction, the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Other central banks and governments around the world did the same thing. So it's now time to pay the piper, which doesn't mean disaster, but it does mean um, it's not the time to go to sleep. 
Understanding the long game is the issue for the long-term investor, while chaos is the issue for the short-term trader, right? They are opposing forces. Don't get caught in the drama of it all. Build your plan. Execute your plan. Stick to your plan. Talk to your advisor. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. European markets are churning lower as investors there grapple with the latest headlines concerning the Fed and the U.S. rates. Um, and, and then what that means for the Eurozone. We already know that inflation across the Eurozone remains an issue, right? And that the ECB and the Bank of England have made it very clear that investors there can also expect what? Higher rates. In the end, it's not a disaster. Markets across the continent are only off about uh, two-tenths of a percent. So it's not a disaster, but there's just ongoing concern. Asian markets ended the, uh, ended the day lower as well, right? China creating more drama, Right, Some now suggesting that the real estate problem in China is even worse than expected. Home prices are down more than 15% in prime neighborhoods around Shanghai and Shenzhen. In addition, we've been going, uh, uh, we, we have the ongoing drama surrounding Country Garden, right? That company that was considered financially sound uh, uh, that has now triggered all kinds of default and contagion fears in the region. Again, take everything with a grain of salt. Stay invested in the developed world not the emerging world, uh, and you'll be good, right? You'll be all good. It's always safer in the developed world. Trust me, so many places to put your money. Oil is now testing $80, right? A level that I think should hold. The move lower being credited to what? The China slowdown. Something I think is ridiculous. UBS just raised their target, by the way, for oil and energy, right? They raised Brent to 95, uh, citing ongoing global demand, including demand from China, and shrinking production by the Saudis and the Russians, right? Think OPEC. All three trend lines now in oil are converging at 75.50 with the short-term trend line pushing up and through the intermediate and long-term, and that's called a golden cross, which usually suggests forward higher prices. Just saying. The dollar index is holding tight at 103.40. Gold continues to test a little bit lower. This morning, it's down two bucks at 19.26 an ounce. It feels to me like it's got 1,900 in the bullseye. The S&P ended the day at 44.04, down 33 points, leaving it down 4.4% in three weeks, right? We breached the short-term support of 44.50 two days ago, which leaves us now in the 42.30, 44.50 broad trading range. A move to 42.30, would represent another 4% lower from here, which would still be within the 10% normal trading range, right? As, uh, and I wouldn't, it would result in an 8.4% move from the high. So put, put it in your head that it's a possibility, but don't put it in your head as a panic. The panic starts at 41.10. That's the level that takes us into the 10% correction territory. Um, and if we hit that, then a swift move lower to shake the branches could easily see another 5% come out of the market. I'm not suggesting that's about to happen. I'm just laying it out there for you to have a data point. It's always good to have these data points as a point of reference, right? Feel free to reach out and discuss. I'm always happy to engage or talk to your own advisor because I'm sure they are always happy to engage as well. Okay, so what do we have for dinner tonight? So this is another vegetarian dish because I keep getting requests for vegetarian dishes. So here you go. Broccoli and fava bean risotto. It's very delicious, right? And when you're making this vegetable risotto, you really can choose any vegetable that you like. Um, this way, it's always different. It's always exciting. Sometimes you can make the risotto to reflect the time of year. In the summer, it might be today's dish. Fall, it could be butternut squash or uh, or corn. In the winter, it might be um, uh, it might be a winter beet. Right. The spring, you might come up with uh, uh, kind of a spring pea risotto. Right. Either way, you get to be creative as you go along, depending on the time. Here. Anyway, for this. You need broccoli florets, right? Cut into small pieces. You need the stems separate. You also got to cut um, cut them into small pieces. You need fava beans, salt and pepper, olive oil, chopped scallions, chopped shallot. You need arborio rice. You need um, a dry white wine. Pinot Gris just on the margarita works for me. You need vegetable stock, about seven cups. You need butter and fresh grated parmigiana cheese or grana padana, one or the other, right? So you want to uh, steam the florets for about one minute. Remove them. Uh, remove, the, remove the stems until they're very tender, right? About four minutes, that's it. Keep the water, don't toss the water away. Put the stems only in the food processor and process until smooth, right? You may have to add some water to make it a smooth mixture. Uh, scrape out the puree into a small bowl and set it aside. Leave the florets whole. 
Now, heat the olive oil in a heavy pan over medium heat. Add the scallions and the shallots, saute until translucent. You know the deal, about five minutes. Now you're going to add the rice. Stir it to coat it in the uh, butter and olive oil. Continue to cook so that the rice becomes a little bit translucent. It's maybe two or three minutes, right? You just want to get it a little bit. Now, pour in the wine, right? Don't overdo it. You know, maybe like a half a cup. Stir it. Let the wine evaporate. The alcohol will burn off. Now you're going to add a ladle of the hot vegetable stock. Uh, you're going to stir constantly until the stock has been absorbed. Right? This is what you have to do risotto. You have to stand there and mix it, right? You're going to continue to add one ladle of the hot stock, one at a time, just enough to moisten the risotto and stir it and cook it until uh, each successive uh, uh, batch is absorbed, right? After risotto has been cooked for about 15 minutes, you're going to add the broccoli puree and the fava beans. Stir to mix about three minutes. Uh, after that, stir in the broccoli florets, stirring constantly, adjusting the level of heat to medium low so that it's just simmering while adding, you, you continue to add the stock, right? Until the, until the rice becomes creamy and delicious. Should only be about 20 to 25 minutes from when you first start, right? Uh, now, remove the pot from the heat when it's creamy and delicious. Add now uh, some butter until it's melted, mix it in there. Now add the grated cheese. Adjust the seasoning with salt if necessary, um, and you can add a little bit of pepper. You wanna serve this immediately and to ladle it into nice warm bowls. And if you, have, if you keep some extra broccoli florets on the side, then just put a couple of broccoli florets on the top after you put it in the bowl. Make sure you always have extra cheese on the table for your guests and enjoy this naturally with a chilled bottle of the Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita the same one that you use to cook with at any event. Look, it's kind of a crummy day outside today, right? It looks a little bit overcast. Yes, it's humid. The doors are all wet. You can see that, but it doesn't really look like it's going to be a beautiful day here today. And I wonder if that speaks about what's going to happen in the markets. We're soon to find out. In any event, until tomorrow, take good care.